Thank you for that amazing presentation. I now like to introduce our panel featuring some of the top experts in agriculture in China, who will be discussing how China is sowing the seeds for a more sustainable food system. Professor Sheng Gen Fan is currently Chair Professor and Dean of the Academy of Global Food Economics and Policy at China Agricultural University. Prior to joining CAU, Prof Fan served as Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, from 2009 to 2019. He also served as the Chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Food and Nutrition Security. Professor Jing Zhu is Dean of the College of Economics and Management at Nanjing Agricultural University and has been appointed Chong Kong Chair Professor, Distinguished Professor by the Ministry of Education of China. She sits on numerous government committees and chairs the Agricultural and Forestry Economics and Management Disciplinary Appraisal Committee of the State Council Academic Commission of China. Professor Xiang Pingjia is the leading scientist at the Agricultural Information Institute at the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. He has been researching a broad range of development issues associated with sustainable farming and has served as advisor and consultant for several international organizations such as the World Bank and the FAO and has also engaged with the private sector and civil society. Our three distinguished professors will each make a brief presentation on their field of expertise before we open up for a moderated Q&A. Our moderator for this panel is Leslie Goh. She is the Senior Technology Advisor and former Chief Technology Officer for the World Bank Group. She is a Fellow at Cambridge Judge Business School and Senior Fellow at the National University of Singapore Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Leslie has extensive international experience advising policymakers and central banks on the regulatory impact from technologies such as artificial intelligence, Internet of Things and 5G. Leslie, over to you. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank Ping Duo Duo for organizing this event and bringing the distinguished thought leaders to share the perspectives in this panel, focusing on China food system. The World Bank launched a flagship report called Digital Transformation in Agri-Food System in March 2021. Rising food insecurity and malnutrition combined with high food loss and waste, agricultural pollution and persistent poverty show that the world's food system is not fit for purpose. And COVID-19 has only worsened existing fault lines in the food and agriculture sector. The ongoing digital transformation would be very important for the food and agriculture sector and create more efficient, equitable, and environmentally sustainable ways to feed people. The flagship report has two folds. It explains the pathway through which digital technologies can accelerate the transformation of the food system. Second, it outlines the role that public policy and investment can play in maximizing the positive and minimizing the negative impact of digital technology this transformation. And the report investigates how digital technologies can improve the allocation of natural and physical resource human capital on the farm and reduce transaction costs off the farm, gaining efficiency. It also analyzes the role of digital agriculture in improving equity and environmental sustainability in food systems and highlights the risk that could emerge along the way. The role of government in this process is to increase the space for private sector activity and improving the policy and regulatory environment and using public investments to crowd in private sector investment in creating incentives to prompt private economic agents to maximize societal benefits. The public sector must also mitigate the potential and sometimes unknown risk arising from the digital agriculture. I have been working with policymakers and ag tech innovators to bring about such digital transformation in the East Asia Pacific region, specific Indonesia, to improve such health, environments, and climate impacts. We draw upon inspirations from the learnings in China. 
I would like to hand it over to Professor Fang to share with us some challenges and opportunities in China with more details on the policy recommendation from his latest report. Over to you, Professor Fang. Thank you, Nesmi. It's a pleasure to talk about several issues related to agri-food system in China. So I'm going to highlight several issues. And number one is challenges that we are facing in our food system. And then how the COVID-19 has impacted the system. And I wanted to move to uh, some of the highlights from the China and the Global Food Policy Report, which was just released a month ago. And then finally, I will touch up on several strategic transitions we need uh, for the Chinese and the global food system uh, to transform itself, or tra transform themselves to achieve both uh, planetary and human health. So we know that food system are facing challenges. Now, at this moment, almost 700 million people are suffering from hunger, the lack of food to eat. And obviously, uh, business as usual, we will even have more hungry people. But by 2030, there will be 840 million hungry people. So there's no way to achieve zero hunger set up, set up by SDG goal, a sustainable development goal uh, number, uh, number two. Now, um, obviously, in terms of the environment, we are facing several so-called planet boundaries, uh, the, um, particularly in terms of climate change, uh, the use of fresh water, the use of land, and the use of nitrogen. So all these have already crossed the planetary boundaries. They are in red zones, yellow zones, and most of them are related to food and agriculture. So the COVID-19 has made the food systems are even more vulnerable. You know, just right after the COVID-19 um, broke in Asia, let's say in China, the, the, the whole supply chains, the whole food supply chain was disrupt, disrupted, particularly a smallholder farming, the small and medium enterprises in food processing, transportation, and a trade. And then obviously because of certain policies, government support and a private connective actions, but the supply side problem has marginally fixed, not only here in China, in, in Asia, but also in Africa. But now the challenge has switched to the demand side because of lost jobs, lost incomes, slow down economic growth. So the people simply do not have enough income to buy the food uh, they wanted to consume. So if you look at the right hand side, you will see that people begin to switch from stable, stable foods to uh, from uh, the more nutritious, healthy foods like fruits and vegetables to cheaper stable foods. So that will compromise long term nutrition, particularly for children and women. So as a result, millions of millions of people cannot afford healthy diets. In fact, it's three billion people will not be able to afford healthy diets because of the COVID-19. And many of these people uh, are in South Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, uh, one thing we have to notice is just for the last a year, maybe even just last 10 months, we have observed such a rapid food price increase by more than 30%. We know that in 2007, 2008, food prices increased by 100%. Millions of millions of people suffered from hunger and malnutrition. So are we going to see another food price crisis? So let's see. And we needed to work together to avoid uh, a perfect storm, that's from climate change, from health crisis, from broken supply chain, and from the shrinking economic growth. So based on this, uh, together with my colleagues, and including Professor Zhu, we published a 2021 China and Global Food Policy Report. We know that because of the rapid deployment of vaccines, sooner or later, probably by the end of this year, I think the situation will become much better. So now the question is, how we're going to rebuild our food systems? Not simply just to recover. I think recovery is not good enough. So we need to build back better for our human health, for our planetary health. So number one is obviously climate change. So China has made a great commitment 
that is to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. And I think the, this will affect the whole food system. So what will be the role of the food system in achieving that target? We know that greenhouse gas emission from the food system has increased by 16% in the last two decades. Only 16% actually. But in 2007, uh, 2017, 2018, we have actually seen the drop in the, in the uh, current emission from the food system, partly because of the reduced the use of fertilizers and pesticides. But nevertheless, the total emission is still very high. And uh, how can we make sure that uh, the total emission will be further reduced and to help the country to achieve carbon neutrality? So together with our colleagues, uh, we modeled the different pathways to achieve carbon neutrality carbon neutrality by 2060, uh, including several uh, important policy instruments, for example, uh, the adoption of technologies, greener technologies on lower carbon, uh, high productivity technologies, and then reducing food waste and food loss and shifting our diets. So all these three instruments can help us to reduce carbon emission. So if we adopt all this together, the China will be able to reduce carbon emission from agriculture, from system, food system, by almost 50% uh, from current 1 billion uh, tons to 400 million tons of, of, of greenhouse gas emission. Then obviously agriculture, or sorry, agriculture land, the forestry land can also help to sequestrate the carbon into the soil. And our model shows that the current the net sequestration is about 1 billion tons, so, which means because of the afforestation planting trees, uh, the 1 billion tons of carbon has been sequestrated to soil. And uh, I think China can do better. China can sequestrate 1.6 billion tons of carbon into, uh, into soil. So you can see food system and land use, land use change can help to sequestrate a net carbon into soil by almost 1 billion tons by 2060, which will help the overall country to achieve carbon neutrality. So the, another important element is transforming our diets. We know that the Chinese diet has shifted towards more fruits, vegetables, meats, uh, seafood, and so on. And uh, that obviously helped to improve uh, the, the diet quality uh, to some extent. On the other hand, uh, we have also seen the cities and a certain middle class population begin to consume more meat, particularly red meat. So if we compare the current diets with recommended diets from the Chinese dietary guidelines, there's a big gap. So the Chinese are consuming much more meat uh, and less fruits, vegetables than they require. So we did a simulation again by shifting the Chinese diets towards that's a more healthy, more sustainable, and obviously more nutritious diets based on the Chinese national dietary guidelines. And we have two important findings. The one is more than one million death will be avoided. The second is it also helps to improve sustainability, to sequestrate the carbon into the soil, to reduce carbon emission by that's by more than 20 percent simply by shifting diets obviously china can do even better now the e-commerce i think leslie has mentioned about the digital revolution globally or here in asia in indonesia uh, that has uh, been a game-changing sort of solutions for many issues in in rural areas particularly in linking smallholders uh, to millions millions of urban consumers. And China obviously uh, is, very, is a typical case. But China currently have 203, uh, 230 million smallholders. And many of them, 70-80% you know, of them, have less than one acre or hectare of land cultivated in land. So now the question is, how can e-commerce or digital uh, it's a revolution can help these smallholders linked to urban centers. I think China has been doing, doing uh, great on, on that regard. For example, between 2014 and 2019, uh, the rural online retail sales 
soared from 180 billion RMB to 1.7 trillion RMB. I think Pinduoduo uh, has been part of that success. But we must be aware that the digital revolution can also cause a digital divide. And that some smallholders do not have capacity, or do not have connectivity, or do not have contents uh, to access to the global markets, uh, urban markets, uh, and so on. Now, the trade is very important. I think Professor Zhu might speak about it. Efficient and resilient trade. So for the last two decades since China joined WTO, uh, the, the trade volume has increased uh, significantly. And in the agriculture food area, so China has, has shifted uh, from a net exporter to a net importer. So today, China is importing almost 100 billion um, tons of, oh, sorry, $100 billion of foods from international markets. You know, to some extent, this is good that China can use resources from other countries to feed its increasingly uh, rich population. On the other hand, it might also uh, have some sort of security issues or risk issues. So the question is how China can diversify, diversify uh, its imports and uh, to use the foreign direct investment to cultivate some of the, um, let's say, import markets. So that China's import will be more diverse and to make sure that China does not depend on one single or two uh, importers to feed its population. Now, based on the reports, we made seven strategic transitions, but China must go through all these transitions. But so number one is tech technological innovations. So these innovations must have multiple wins. The win in yield, win in nutrition, win in sustain sustainability, or win in carbon, carbon mitigation or, or climate mitigation. The second is to repurpose subsidies. At global level, so there are $700 billion subsidies in agriculture. And these subsidies are not sustainable. They do not produce a healthy nutritious foods smallholders do not benefit from them. So how can we repurpose all these subsidies to produce healthy, nutritious, and sustainable foods? And number three is to invest in new infrastructure. So IT, I call it a new infrastructure compared to traditional infrastructure like the roads, electricity, irrigation. This must make sure that uh, the penetration rate of internet in rural areas uh, will be further enhanced, particularly in Africa and South Asia. And number four is institutional innovations. If we wanted to use a food system approach, then we needed to have the governance around that, the Ministry of Agriculture, Environment, uh, its trade, health must work together to use food and agriculture for improving health and improving environment and mitigate the climate change. And respect nature. We learned a huge lesson from COVID-19. So zoonotic diseases have been increased you know, probably exponentially for the last decade or two because we didn't respect nature. The distance between human being and nature has become closer and closer. So the diseases can easily jump from animals to human beings. And the next is open, let's maintain open and resilient trade. The trade is still very critical. Trade can allocate resources more efficiently, can mitigate the, the climate, in, climate change more effectively. Because like different parts of the world have different carbon, carbon footprints from food production. And finally, to change our behavior. We know that what we eat matters to our health. It also matters to our environment. So let's change our behavior. If we wanted to change the world, we must change ourselves. So let's start from our top. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fan. That was very well said, and I'll remember that dearly. Now, next, I would like to invite Professor Zhu, who was also a contributor to the report, and she will present about the specific policies laid out in the 14th five-year plan, which will shape agriculture developments for the years to come. Over to you, Professor Zhu. 
Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. It's really my great pleasure to share with you the 14th five-year plan and the outline of long-term objectives for the next five years with a focus on agriculture and food system. Um, these documents are released in March this year and have been widely discussed and will be implemented by all departments and all works of life in China uh, in the next five years. There are altogether 19 sections, 65 chapters in this document, with agriculture mostly dealt with in section seven, prioritizing agriculture and the rural development, promote the rural revitalization, and partly touch the problem in other sections as well. Um, today, because of the time limits, I would like to focus on section seven, the major section completely devoted to agriculture and the rural development, which comprise of four chapters, 23 through 26, um, including improving quality, efficiency, and the competitiveness of agriculture, implement actions to improve rural infrastructure and environment, and carry out a rural institutional reform for a harmonized and integrated rural and urban development and on the smooth transition of working efforts from poverty elevation to rural revitalization. Needless to say, there are massive information embedded in these four chapters, but I would like to draw everybody's attention to box 10, which have eight action projects for modernizing of agriculture and the rural areas in China. Because when it becomes a project explicitly listed in the official plan, it is believed to have gone beyond the mere verbal declaration of importance and come to the stage of serious and immediate implementation and followed usually by either budget outlays or other ways of resource mobilization and the results of this uh, projects will be checked out later on. So let's go over them one by one. The first one is the, for developing high standard farmland. Of course, it is a continuation upgrading from the 13th five-year plan with the goal of another 275 million mu, equivalent to 18 million hectare in the next five years, on top of the 800 million mu of high standard farmland completed in the 13th five-year plan. It is also noticeable that water saving, soil protection are among the key words in the targets in this plan, indicating the country's dedication to transit to a more sustainable food system, starting from the very beginning stage of production. The second on the list is the modern seed industry. The importance of seed cannot be emphasized enough in these recent years, where food security has been reiterated once and again for a populous nation like China in the midst of a volatile international environment this few years. And we could see that constructing national long-term and mid-term germplasm resources bank for crops, upgrading national and regional breeding and production bases in the various of regions in China, not only for crops, but also for livestock have been mapped out and setting up in clear objectives in this plan. I would expect to see massive public R&D as well as commercial investment in this area. Then comes agricultural mechanization. In the 14th five-year plan, mechanization of farmlands in hilly and mountainous areas are particularly pointed out, mirroring the fact that China is abundant more in this kind of land than the luxurious flat plain. And the next one is animal epidemic prevention and crop pest control. We can see from the 13th five-year plan, there's a concentration on the prevention and the control of disease and insect pests of crops. 
and the develop pollution free and organic food usually is also targeted to the crops. But in the 14th five year plan, animal disease and epidemic prevention has come into the scene and comprised the major part in this task force or the project number four. This is a reflection of the transition of diet of the people with rising income and the concern for more healthy and nutritious food, as well as the concern for the environmental impact. The concern for environment and the greener production in the food system is once again highlighted in action project number five, control of agricultural non-point source pollution. Building on the action plan of zero increase of fertilizer and the pesticides by 2020 issued by the Ministry of Agriculture in 2015, the 14th five-year plan set further stage targets along the environmental sensitive areas of the Yangtze and the Yellow River, aiming at the treatment and recycling of wastes in livestock and aquatic production. Modern agriculture and the rural development is not only manifested in the stage of agricultural production, but also along the value chain. One of the most significant is the building up of cold chains for food logistics. Up to the end of last year, 2020, 14 official documents have already been issued by government on the development of cold chain transportations, deliveries for agriculture and food products, leading to an annual growth rate of more than 15% of market share during the last three years. In the 14th five-year plan, 30 national and 70 regional cold chain transportation bays will be built up with cold keeping facilities for warehouses and slaughterhouses, etc., upgraded and renovated. Of course, China is sometimes deemed as crazy about infrastructure, but we have to admit that rural infrastructure is still way behind, especially at the stage of what we call the last one mile. So in the 14th five-year plan, in addition to the rural water projects, the hard road connecting, a connecting between villagers and the within villages are listed as goals, together with the virtual road, electricity and internet setting up as key indicators for the development of rural infrastructure. The last of the eight action projects is to improve rural living environment where laboratory, laboratories, garbages, and sewage treatments are specific targets for upgrading. Besides the above mentioned eight projects, there have been related aspects in other sections that are worth noting, including improving domestic circulation, speeding up digital China, building up smart cities, and digital countryside to develop domestic demand system, etc. It could be inferred from the plan that in the next five years, agriculture and the food system in China will become more efficient, more sustainable and environmentally friendly. Modern technologies in seed, soil protection, fertilizer and pesticide production and appl application, etc., will be developed and upgraded with much endeavor. At the same time, massive investment would be expected to devote to rural infrastructure, both for modern agriculture development and for the improvement of rural living. And the linkage between rural and urban will become tighter and closer. The food system will be upgraded and empowered by modern technology along the value chain. And the mo uh, modernization, including the infrastructure building and the market development in rural areas, may give rise to possible exponential expansion of consumption of urban made products and vice versa, the rural areas will tap the potential for urban developers consumption with not only more highly, I mean, higher quality nutritious food, but with also beautiful environment for rural tourism.
and all the above could be realized and reinforced with digitalization as an irreplaceable accelerator. With that, I would like to end my um, presentation and my personal understanding of the plan outline of the 14th five-year plan. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhu, for the in-depth analysis of the rural development, one of the critical challenge that to address to, for the needs of the smallholder farmers. Let's hear next from Professor Jia about the state of the growth and adoption of agri-tech solutions in China and the role played by the venture capital. Over to you, Professor Jia. Okay, thank you for inviting me to uh, do this and uh, congratulations to uh, Pindoda Global and for organizing this knowledge uh, event. And uh, Professor Fan and uh, Professor Zhu uh, has introduced uh, from the policy perspective, also from the food system perspective. And my talk is going to be focusing on a subcategory of uh, private sector. We are fortunate in living in an era and with many inspiring uh, innovation that are changing our life. And they share something in common. And for example, they are highly impactful. They, they are highly uh, growing. And most of the early development of this innovation were, were supported and backed by venture capital. And both China and the uh, United States uh, are two leading uh, economy in the world about venture capital. But uh, the development of uh, venture capital in China is only in recent years. There, there have been many emerging uh, use of the uh, the high data science and digital technology and from the venture capital market. So a natural inquiry was uh, how such an audacious and inventive new generation of uh, innovation uh, present themselves in food and agriculture sector. And with this inquiry and my uh, team and, uh, and colleagues working with uh, several partners in venture, capital industry and we did uh, we did a, a thorough survey on, on the emerging entrepreneurs uh, of this field and this is only part of the 400 cases so this is a, a, a primary finding of the of the survey and uh, over the time 2010 to 2018 and for uh, 10,000 venture capital investment, less than 3% of the transaction were made uh, in the field of uh, food and, and agriculture. And, but if you look at the right chart, it shows some interesting finding. For example, the, right, the scale of the right axis is 10% to the left. So that shows uh, where the red line converge with the blue line or even higher, it shows uh, the venture capital in, uh, in agriculture and food uh, in that year is about 10% and even higher of the total venture capital investment of the year. From, from time to time, over the period of uh, 2010 to 2018, and the venture capital investment in China relating with the food and, agri and agriculture has been showing great dynamics in, in investment stage and also regional distribution. So for example, uh, in early years, and many of the investment were made in, uh, in early, early, but from time to time and the late stage investment are, are going up. And if we look at the right panel of the figure, it shows the regional distribution of, uh, of these uh, venture capital uh, investment deals. And in early stage, uh, East and uh, North China uh, has been greatly uh, populated for such an investment. But in, in recent years, especially uh, after 2015, and the South and Southwest and the Central China are on the rise for such an uh, emerging uh, investment. And as uh, Professor Fan Xingen mentioned in his uh, presentation, and rural commerce, uh, rural e commerce has been emerging and quite well developed in China. And, and, and many of these uh, uh, innovation uh, in rural sites were, were backed by venture capital. And from time to time, um, 
more and more uh, such a venture capital-backed uh, innovation are, are focusing now on technology and uh, service-based rather than marketing-based. So that's a, a, a trendy and a dynamic of, uh, of the thematic focus of this innovation. So it's, it's a natural inquiry for people and who are, the, who are these innovators? And when we look at uh, the, the background of these, uh, these uh, entrepreneurs, and we find very little of them had a, had a, a formal education background in agriculture. And uh, for these 5% uh, uh, entrepreneurs, and none of them obtained uh, a venture capital investment uh, at the late stage. But a very interesting uh, finding is that one third of the uh, these innovator had a had a entrepreneurial experience before, and uh, if you look at these people, and many of them obtained uh, uh, VC in late stage. So that shows some interesting how the 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 background and identity and how it is associated with the capability of obtaining venture capital, especially for the late stage. And now. Uh, Let's uh, let's go outside China and look at the world. And in the past decade, the landscape of development finance in the world has been changed greatly, and many of the conventional donor and investors are transforming from conventional approach to now called blended finance. And despite a varied definition, blended finance. Uh, is the strategic use of uh, different finance for additional mobilized funding towards SDG and, and impact investment. For example, uh, the OECD report uh, uh, shows that in the past decade, additional 100 billion US dollar were additionally uh, leveraged for, for development purpose. And one third of these uh, blended finance transactions were actually associated with agriculture. The, uh, the blended finance has not been mainstreamed in China yet, but a similar practice uh, has been on the rise in China. It is called a government guidance fund. Uh, by, uh, by first quarter 2020, a total of uh, 11 trillion RMB were raised and and uh, and and uh, well, unfortunately, very few uh, of these uh, GGF were on agriculture, but uh, not zero. For example, uh, at the national level, uh, some fund have been made with the purpose of poverty uh, lifting, and through uh, islands of uh, several state-owned uh, companies. At the provincial level. And uh, some government, for example, Yunnan, has has uh, raised the so-called uh, highland modern agriculture. And last year, World Bank uh, approved a loan. Uh, it's about 300 uh, million US dollar in total in Henan province for mainly uh, green agriculture. So at the prefecture level, and, and there there have been several uh, similar uh, structured fund. So if we compare uh, the governance of uh, the, the global blended finance and the Chinese uh, GGF. And there, there are some similarity. For example, they're both a structured fund and with multiple uh, investors. But uh, um, for blended finance, the governance is, uh, is relatively simplified because it's, it's, a, it's very much a, a risk adjusted purpose. And but the Chinese uh, GGF is more complicated. They have a, a diversified interest and stakeholders, and uh, uh, it has the benefits of coordination. But in the meantime, it's very hard to to uh, design an evaluation scheme and uh, uh, to to evaluate the effectiveness and even the transparency. So one of the uh, one of the uh, major difference between GGF and the Chinese. Uh, uh, and a blended finance is that uh, for blended finance, um, it has a aligned interest or it has aligned measurement towards uh, with uh, either SDG or ESG standards. 
And for example, if you look at blended finance, many of the uh, fund itself may not be SDG driven, but uh, more than 150 uh, new facilities were, were specializing on this blended finance and many of them are SDG driven. So this is some uh, take home message and also uh, hopefully some reflection for uh, Pinduoduo Global and others. And I have noticed that this, uh, the thematic title of this knowledge event is uh, planting seed. So my, uh, my uh, concluding uh, message is to go beyond planting seed because it's relatively easier to have innovation, but it's very hard to have innovation survive. So scaling matters. And in the meantime, uh, as the presentation show from uh, Shengen and also uh, Dr. Zhu, and many of these uh, agriculture issues have a blended uh, value for both commercial and social purpose. And then uh, the reflection would be, what is the role uh, of finance from a system perspective, for example, for the next five year plan, and then how to align and how to partner um, between the blended finance at a global perspective and also the Chinese practices, for example, GGF. That's an that's a, a, a interesting area for a global community to, to explore in the future. So this ends with my presentation and, and there are some additional guiding reference uh, associated with the topics I have today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Professor Jia, for the great insights on the private sector investment landscape and particularly blended finance to increase the impact for the public good investment and uh, scale out agriculture transformation throughout the entire value chain. Now, next, I would like to invite all three distinguished professors to join me in this panel discussion. Perhaps I'll start with Professor Fan of the recommendations in your policy report, which ones do you think are the most actionable? What has been the response thus far to these recommendations? Yeah, I think we have to move all these recommendations, actions. We just cannot wait. And it's a package. It's rather difficult to say which one is more actionable than others. But uh, among all the seven, I would uh, it's a rank number two, that is repurposing subsidies. Poverty are more doable. You know, the money is there. Uh, globally, it's $700 billion. China probably also has quite a bit of amount of money in subsidizing, let's say, uh, food prices, purchasing prices. Now, so can we repurpose these subsidies? There's still the same amount, amount of money, keep them in agriculture, but use that money for the, the, uh, the issues we have just discussed, let's say for sustainability, for nutrition, for health, for resilience, not simply just for in, increasing yield of stable food production. So I think this also is more actionable than others. For example, the change in people's behavior will take some time. Obviously, we must work on it. The investment in infrastructure, you know, as Professor Zhu and Professor Zhao all mentioned, but you know it requires some, a substantial amount of money. But starting from subsidies is more actionable and probably uh, can make some short-term impact. I would tend to agree with you because I'm actually looking at big data and how the data could really illuminate how we could analyze a subsidy in fertilizer as an example and making it more effective um, uh, use of the subsidy for the, the outcome we, we hope to achieve. So thank you for your response to that question. Maybe I'll pass it over to Professor to looking at the policy directions of the 14th five-year plan that you have laid out. In your opinion, what are some of the opportunities for overseas companies and institutions to partner and contribute? Yeah, thank you for this very good question. Um, as I have mentioned, there are quite a lot of areas that need more investment, massive investment. I think at least there are three aspects that uh, foreign entrepreneur and foreign 
capitals can come in and cooperate with uh, uh, these projects. The first one is the modern technology in agriculture, whether it is in seed, in the fertilizer, pesticide, modern technology, and environmental protection and monitoring facilities, as well as the um, agriculture machinery um, and the animal health protection technologies. I think all this, uh, in, in all these areas, uh, many of the developed countries have very advanced technologies and they can come in and uh, uh, cooperate with the uh, Chinese side, either with the government agencies or with uh, commercial enterprises. And the second uh, 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 space for uh, collaboration and for investment is to invest on the value chain system, I mean the food system. Uh, for example, the cold chain system, which is much emphasized by the government in this 14th five-year plan. And comparing with the developed countries, the, uh, uh, the fresh food uh, um, storage is very much behind. And the, the rate of uh, a loss is two to three times higher than those of the developed countries. So many of the good experiences and good technologies, as well as the institutional arrangements are welcome uh, from China's side. And I think uh, uh, the countries that with this kind of uh, technologies and enterprises should come in to China to uh, invest, to help China, and also to uh, have uh, good returns from that area. The third, of course, is to tap the potential of the big, big market in China. Uh, either from developing or developed uh, countries with their good, diversified, high-quality, nutritious food and other food-related uh, products. Uh, I think there's huge room for the foreign, I mean the overseas uh, uh, funds and investment uh, to go to China to uh, involve more into the projects of the 14th five-year plan in the area of agriculture and rural development. Thank you. Great insights. Thank you so much. The opportunity is quite immense. So I would like to hand it over to Professor Jia. Could we, I was very uh, fascinated by your analysis of the private sector and ag tech because I'm also looking at the landscape right now around the world and China ag tech sector is very interesting. Um, and how do you see the ag tech VC and China, um, the government guidance fund GGF evolving with the rest of the world in the blended finance? And do you see more ag tech fo focused VCs or incubators coming up? As uh, Dr. Fang and uh, Professor Drew mentioned also in, in their presentation, and many of these um, uh, agriculture policies right now are promoting agriculture and the food system to transform to a sustainable way. And But in the meantime, if we look back the past decade, especially the landscape or the, the industry of venture capital, and it has not evolved into that trend yet. So uh, most of the uh, venture capital is uh, for commercial purpose, right? And, but then if you look at the blended finance and uh, from global perspective, it's a mission driven and they have a, uh, I mean, additional uh, concept like impact investment. So that is a, a fundamental difference between the GGF and, uh, and also the blended finance. But they are having some common, uh, uh, some uh, synergy between the two and they are both a structure fund and uh, they both involved uh, multiple uh, purpose and different stakeholders. And for the Chinese GGF, it has a, a larger benefits for coordination between different silos and different uh, field. And it has a larger, as uh, Dr. Fan Shingen mentioned, it's a, a system way of uh, addressing the challenges. So I see, uh, I see a lot of potential in the future to um, have this mindset behind uh, and also approaches of measurement metrics and, uh, and, and a, a few tools being applied and integrated in China's GGF so that uh, the GGF is not just a commercial or, or, 
or economic value based, but also social value based on oriented as, as well. Thank you. Great. Well, I would like to invite all of you to answer a very important question. How will China's success in agriculture impact the world? Thank you for this uh, privilege to answer this question. Um, I think it's uh, related to what I have also mentioned. I think the impact would be on both developing countries and developed countries. For developing countries, I think China's success actually is achieved through many lessons learned. So some of the lessons could be uh, shared uh, by the developing countries. For example, the pollution problem. Uh, we need to strive for the food security objective, but with some uh, measures taken that proved to be not so efficient and not so environmental friendly, etc. So these lessons could be learned by the developing countries in their uh, strive for their food security and the other objectives in agriculture production. And another aspect for uh, uh, the developing countries to be impacted by the China's uh, agriculture success is to probably more chances for cooperation with China or collaboration with China in terms of FDI of China's agriculture uh, production. As Professor Fan has also mentioned, China to achieve food security need to help the world or need to facilitate other parts of the world to increase their agricultural production. And most of this uh, increase would happen in developing countries, especially in those regions that are lacking technologies and that lacking uh, necessary uh, imports in agriculture production. And for the developed world, I think the technology cooperation needed in China will provide a lot of chance of investment uh, opportunities. And also the market, as I've mentioned, uh, is big for those uh, um, uh, countries to, to have their agricultural products, high quality, nutritious, nutritious and diversified um, products to enter into uh, China. So I think there were quite a lot of uh, uh, impact of China's agriculture success over different parts of the world. Thank you. Uh, I always say that the Chinese food security is global food security and vice versa. Global food security is also Chinese food security because China accounts for more than 20% of the world's population. If China does not have food security, obviously, no, there's no world food security. But if there is no food security in Africa, in South Asia, or in Latin America, that would be very expensive for Chinese to achieve its food security. So I always say that's uh, uh, so they're mutually reinforcing. So the Chinese importance in global food security is reflected through several ways. So one is trade. China is one of the largest agriculture trader. The second is the foreign direct investment. China is also one of the largest foreign direct investors including in food and agriculture. The third is obviously technology transfer. The Chinese technology in food and agriculture can be transferred to other countries. And then um, the fourth is mutual learning, the policy uh, for picking the best practices that can be shared between China and other countries. And the final needs a global governance. So more and more of the Chinese now are serving uh, as researchers, as leaders, uh, as administrators of some of the global institutions, for example, FAO, uh, WTO, and uh, or CGIA, the Global Agriculture Research Institution. That I'm a board member, and the Professor Zhu is a board member of one of the centers, International Livestock Research Institutes. I think China must continue to do that through all these channels to make sure that uh, China's voice will be reflected in some of the global uh, agenda setting. Now, I just wanted to mention that the, the uh, Global Food System Summit will be held in New York in September. I really hope China will bring its voice over there and to bring some of the best practices for other countries uh, to learn and to share. Thank you. Definitely. I'm looking forward to that food summit as well. And Professor Jia, would you like to add to that comment? Yes, of course. And uh, my uh, discussion to your question is mainly two folks and first recognizing and acknowledging the world is uh, pluralistic and diversified especially at the agenda perspective 
So uh, in addition to the economic uh, dimension developed, developing the world is very diversified in value system and social value and, 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 and even culture. And each uh, country has their uh, historical uh, roots uh, in, in food system and uh, consumption habit. Right. So, uh, but there, there has not been um, some uh, well identified global community that is able to recognize uh, this highly uh, diversified uh, uh, situation. So, as Shinga mentioned, the, the summit, and not only the Chinese voice is being heard, but many uh, voice from Africa is supposed to be heard, and uh, many tribal uh, and even uh, culture, uh, culture community. Is supposed to be presenting in such a global perspective. This is this is my first uh, uh, first comment. The second is going, is to um, to have China involved uh, to facilitate a, a global marketplace. So the marketplace is uh, not just for 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 exchange or mar marketing uh, trade or products, but also a marketplace for knowledge and experience, in, including policies. So there have there have been many things for China to share and also to learn from other uh, partners in different countries, uh, such as uh, venture backed in innovator in I know in Africa there have there have been many uh, good innovation as well. So there must be some uh, marketplace to exchange this. So this is my uh, discussion. Excellent. Well, I really want to thank all of you for your great insights. Um, as China looks forward to reforms for a new era of sustainable development in a changing world, I think we have lots to learn from China as a shift towards more well-being, quality and sustainability at the center stage. I wish uh, all of you good health and wishing China uh, the, the reforms towards healthy people, healthy planet and healthy economy. Thank you, everyone.